So each time it swaps a pair of elements, it plays a sound of both of them, which is, you can, you can hear the sort of fluctuating pitches. Each time it compares it, each pair of elements, it plays a noise and then potentially swaps them. Um, what we thought we'd do is make them all sort uh, 100 elements and you can see them side by side. In the last couple of videos we've done on sorting algorithms, there's been quite a few comments uh, on the videos and requests from people to do uh, some more on different sorting algorithms. So it's been a couple of weeks since we did the videos and um, also there's been some more videos on Computerfile. In particular, I saw the one on the BBC Micro. So the BBC wanted to develop a project to introduce people to computers and uh, programming. They commissioned a British company called Acorn to make this computer. And how easy it is to use BASIC to draw things on the screen and make noises. This is an A5000 which is a computer made by Acorn, which dates from about 1991, I think. So um, it's, it's kind of a descendant of the BBC Micro. It's, it's got an ARM chip, uh, which the BBC Micro didn't have. Because it's uh, an Acorn, it's got, um, it's got a BBC Basic interpreter built into it. There is a BBC Basic interpreter for Windows, uh, it's a bit limited in terms of what you can use for memory, and I didn't want to have to pay for it. And I have this sitting in a corner. Like the BBC Micro, the operating system is in ROM, so you turn it on and it's, it's pretty quick to boot up. So we just wait and... There we go, it's booted up. Unlike the BBC Micro, this boots up into a GUI. You've got a mouse and some things to click on. This is called the icon bar at the bottom here. And this is a hard drive icon, so you click on that, it opens the contents of the hard drive in a window that look familiar to you probably if you used any modern operating system. This is the floppy drive here. So you click on that, it'll say drive empty, as it is. And then we've got apps, which are some built-in applications and networking. And over here we've got sort of graphics options and operating system options. So Acorn were talking about apps back in the 90s? Well, yeah, it's just short for applications. So if you click on it, You've got some built-in basic things, so you've got an alarm which tells you the time. If you click on configure, it brings up the configuration, so you can change things like sound options, so I can change the noise to be various different things. When I was looking at sorting algorithms on YouTube, I found uh, another video, or another couple of videos, made by someone else who had written a program in C++ that did visualisation of sorting algorithms. So it would um, show you an unsorted list and it would sort it into order. Each time it would swap a pair of elements or do something, it would play a certain pitch depending on the value of that element. Well, that's quite interesting, but there are some sorting algorithms that they haven't done that I'd like to see, so I thought I'd do it myself. They posted their source code and it was using some C++ library that I couldn't get an up-to-date version of on my system. So a, a library is just a collection of of code written by other people that does a certain task for you, so you can, you can just use that. Most people use libraries of code because you can generally be guaranteed that it does what it's supposed to do correctly. And I thought, well, having seen that BBC Basic video and the, the, the triangles program on screen, I can show you, you know, I did my own implementation. As well as putting the triangle on screen, I also decided to make it make a noise. So if I can show you the source code for that. This is it. I'm going to put some spaces in, just to make it a little bit clearer. And mode 27 tells it what screen resolution to use and what colours available, that sort of thing. OK, and then we've got this repeat until false block. What it does, it repeats all this until false. And now false never evaluates to true, so it just repeats it forever. This says set a variable called colour to a random number between 0 and 7. This then says set the graphics colour to that random number between 0 and 7. Then we play a sound related to that random number as well. So the numbers between 0 and 7, we need to scale it to be in the range 0 to 255. So that's the pitch value. And it, 0 is the lowest pitch it does, and 255 is the highest pitch it will do. If we left it 0 to 7, it would just be very low, and they'd all sound quite similar. This line that says plot actually draws a triangle, so that's what you would have seen in the other video. Now this line is here to slow it down, because it goes very fast on this. So I'll, if I comment this line out, we use rem, which I think stands for reminder. So if I save that and then I run triangles again, it goes so fast that you can't hear any sound because as soon as it starts playing one sound, it tries to stop playing the next and you can't hear anything. Another thing I used was um, a book that came into my possession or came into the office called Games for Your BBC Micro. 
This is just code listings of, of certain games. The first one I did was quite short. It's called Dr. Audio. It says, this game is a variation of Dr. Watson in which when you guess the computer's number, the feedback is given as a tone. The pitch of this note varies according to how far your guess is from the correct number. The sounds are programmed in line 130. This is how I learned how to do sounds because it said line 130, sound one, minus 15, abs A minus B, five. So it turns out that, I had to look this up because it wasn't in this book. Sounds takes one, two, three, four different uh, parameters. So the first one is the channel you want it to play on. Uh, I think channel zero does percussion sounds or something strange. So anyway, the, the first argument says play it on channel one. The second one is the volume and that has to be between, I think, zero and minus 15. Minus 15 is the loudest, zero is the quietest. This says abs A minus B, so that subtracts one number from the other and um, gets you the absolute value of it. And then the last one is the duration of the note. It's in centiseconds, so it's five hundredths of a second it plays it for. Here goes the program. They might have rude words in it, I can't remember. <laughs> so, so I am thinking of a number between one and a hundred, what is it? So let's go for you know, 25. Okay, it was changed a little bit from what it said in the book, <laughs> but I rewrote it so the higher the pitch is, the closer it is. 25 is wrong, you moron. So what's my next guess? I'm gonna say um, 75. So 75 sounds closer. Let's try 80. No, that's, that's further away. Uh, 60. Yeah, I'm gonna go for 70. <laughs> Hooray. Where was the disc then with that book? <laughs> Where's the disk? The disk is, uh, the data is stored on the pages, which means you've got to transfer it via your hands and the keyboard. <laughs> so show me what that meant. Okay, so what I had to do is um, type everything in to a nice text editor. This one's not particularly nice. This is the code that does that program. This is a, a, about 30 lines probably. Now I kind of was a little bit more familiar with BBC Basic and how to draw things in certain colours and how to play sounds. I decided that I could probably implement those visual sorting programmes. So first of all, we've got bubble sort. I think this sorts uh, 30 elements. So with bubble sort, we compare elements and keep swapping elements if they're bigger than the ones we're in front of until they get to the end. So um, the green elements are the ones that are in the right place. Red elements are. Uh, unsorted and the blue ones are sort of ones that are being the ones that are active at the moment. So for 30 elements that took 23.38 seconds, 384 comparisons and 228 swaps. So if we change it to 60 elements, open it in the editor and change max file from 30 to, oops, to 60. So save that. Okay so now we've got 60 elements We've doubled the input size, and because it runs with the square of the input size, two times two is four, so it should take four times as long, with four times the number of comparisons and four times the number of swaps. Each time it does a comparison and each time it does a swap, it, it increments a counter and just prints it out up here. So each time it swaps a pair of elements, it plays a sound of both of them, which is, you can, you can hear the sort of fluctuating pitches. Each time it compares it, each pair of elements, it plays a noise and then potentially swaps them. getting smaller now. We're only sorting, say, 20, maybe now. What this is showing uh, us is each of these columns, which is the same width, is a different number. And so that's a low number, and at this end you've got a high number. So when we start out, the list is unsorted, so you've got sort of all high and low columns all next to each other. And when we have sorted the list, end up with low numbers at that end and high numbers at that end. We also covered quick sort in our previous videos, so I'll we'll show you that. So there's a variable called number of elements, so that's set to a thousand, so I'm going to reduce it to say uh, 400. Okay, and we've also got another option here, so we can set graphical to true or false. Actually what you find is, if you really want to do proper speed tests, you need to turn the graphics off because they slow it down a lot. If you want to prove a point and uh, do something like this. By the way, this graph is linked to from the previous sorting videos. So let's save that and then run it. So we've got quick sort. So here's our list of unsorted elements. So you can see there's all sorts of high and low ones. Hopefully you'll remember from the video on quick sort. The way this works, it partitions the list by picking an element called a pivot and putting all, all elements less on it on one side and greater than it on the other side. And then it then it does that again on each sub on each side. So you can see it's kind of 
So it's done all the left hand side and now it will start doing the right hand side. So there's the pivot, it does all the left hand side, picks another pivot and keeps doing that until it's sorted. You can see with quick sort it is a lot quicker than double sort. Another algorithm we, that we didn't cover before, but is still fairly simple, is called selection sort. You go through your list and you look for the lowest element that's in the, in the unsorted list, and you take that and you put it in your sorted list. And you go through the unsorted list, pick the lowest element from there, put that in your sorted list. Here's 100 elements being selection sorted. We've got to look through the whole list, find the smallest, and then we put it at the other end. So... Is this a quick one? This is not particularly quick. This also is n squared because you've got to look at you've got to look at these over and over again. It's the same time complexity as bubble sort, although I think it might perform a little bit better because it does slightly fewer comparisons. Well, it certainly does fewer swaps. It only needs to do at most one swap per element in the list, whereas bubble sort can go crazy. The comparisons are still quite high, and that makes it a little bit slow. Um, what we thought we'd do is make them all sort uh, 100 elements and um, you can see them side by side and hopefully uh, sped up a bit because some of them are quite slow. What we've seen is bubble sort and cocktail sort and selection sort are quite slow in comparison to quick sort. Um, quick sort runs in n log n, um, as we said in the quick sort video. Uh, another algorithm that people were asking about in the comments is heap sort. That also runs in n log n. You need quite a lot of background knowledge to understand how it works. So heap sort uses something called a heap. Now, a heap is a type of data structure which is represented by a binary tree whereby every element in the tree um, has children who are smaller than it. We haven't covered trees. To cover trees we need to probably cover linked lists. To cover linked lists we need to do something about data structures and we haven't got there yet. However, I will show you heap sort before I start it. What it does, it builds a heap up. The largest element is always at zero and then it swaps that element to the, the end and it restructures the heap so that the largest elements are again at that end. Well, well let's, let's go. So this is building up the heap. Now it's built the heap. It can keep taking the largest element and maintaining the heap structure and producing a sorted list. That was quite quick. That was 100 elements, so it's the same as the other ones we've just seen. If you know what heap is, and not, it's, it's different from the heap. The heap is um, an area of memory, as opposed to the stack. But the heap and a heap, not the same thing. So Ethernet is not concerned with the internet the as a whole. It's not concerned with getting something uh, to those the only two we can see, so we pick four on that list. And then we say, which is lowest between seven and eight? It's seven. Uh, which is lowest between 8 and nothing, it's 8, and then similarly with 10 and nothing, it's 10. It's the idea that we've got it in the case of IPv4. 